Thank you for joining us for this special series of This is Getting Old. Sponsored by the Health and Aging Policy Fellows Program, Capstone Conversations is brought to you by Melissa B., Ph.D., in collaboration with the George Washington University's Center for Aging, Health, and Humanities. Welcome to This is Getting Old. I'm your host, Melissa Batchelor, and today we're going to be talking about elder care, both past and future. And I'm joined today um, by Joanne Lynn and Carrie Graham. Thank you both for being here today. And um, Joanne is a current Health and Aging Policy Fellow, and uh, this is part of our capstone conversation. She's going to kick off this special series that we're doing. So I'll let you guys introduce yourself, and then we'll talk about Joanne's um, experience. So my background is as a geriatrician, health services researcher, quality improvement coach, but right now I'm the Health and Aging Policy Fellow in Representative Tom Swazi's office, and I'm also a policy analyst at Altarum, a nonprofit uh, consulting and research group in health working on uh, vulnerable populations. Carrie? So yeah, my name is Carrie Graham, and I guess I would say I'm a lifelong gerontologist. Um, I worked my way through college as an activity director in a nursing home calling bingo, and from then went on to get a master's degree in gerontology. I've been working in research and evaluation, uh, mostly in California ever since, but I was honored to be a health and aging policy fellow last year, and I worked in the Committee on Ways and Means in their health subcommittee. And the health subcommittee has, is one of the committees that has jurisdiction over Medicare. So I work quite a bit in post-acute care and issues related to trying to revive long-term services and supports um, in Medicare. The, then when my fellowship was over, I got the kind of the policy bug. So I went on to work in California as a consultant to California's Master Plan for Aging, which was an executive order by Gavin Newsom, our governor, who um, asked for us to bring together stakeholders and spend a year doing uh, stakeholder planning to re reform, revise, transform aging services in California. Of course, during that year, COVID hit, um, but we are back on track <laughs> with the master plan. So, so just a small job. <laughs> it's, it's, it's no big deal. I got lots of free time. <laughs> So Joanne, I will let you start by just um, sharing some of your experience and we're gonna be talking about nursing homes and COVID. Um, so we'll let you kick this off. Now, obviously COVID has overwhelmed uh, most of our plans um, and I ended up uh, spending a great deal of effort um, on trying to uh, keep reporters and others uh, attuned to what was happening to seriously disabled elders in the COVID era. Um, and uh, then also, you know, what I was originally trying to do was to improve our financing of elder care. Uh, we are really facing quite a crisis as the numbers grow and the savings dwindle uh, to have very large numbers of elderly people who, um, in the time when they need help, uh, have no resources. Um, and uh, we also um, have come to feel that there needs to be community anchor in managing elder care. Uh, communities need to know how they stand and how they're performing. So we've been working a lot on developing data for uh, county level uh, descriptions of how elder care is working all across the country. So those are sort of what I've been doing most recently and um, you know, trying to hit the priorities that appear to uh, kind of create the future. Okay. Um, so you mentioned the geographic um, data. So why is that an important thing for communities to have? Well, if you think about what happens to a person when they become very disabled in old age, uh, so much depends upon their geographic community. Not so much which insurance company they have, whether they're in Medicare Advantage, what doctor they have, um, but is there a workforce that can help out when the person needs intimate care? Is there a transportation system? Is there housing that's all on one floor and wheelchair accessible? Um, yeah, an awful lot of what happens to people depends upon the resources and of pro, pro, um, preparation of their community. So um, 
we've been working with a dozen communities trying to figure out how to get that to work. And they all kept running into the problem that there just isn't really good data. So we um, have been working with a couple of groups that have access to Medicare data. And we have come up with now uh, almost 400 columns of data describing every county in the country. And we're beginning to pull from that to learn what it is that counties can use, who in the county would be willing to use it. Is it the Area Agency on Aging, the Public Health Office, a, a consortium of medical providers? You know, sort of who is it who would pull things together and be willing to track whether the county's doing well or badly on one thing or another? It doesn't get to everything. It's hard to get to things like how many families are bankrupted. It's hard to get to um, considerations like um, you know, whether um, the doctors in the county are over treating, but, but you can get a pretty good look and um, you know, it's a start. So give me some examples of some of the data points that, that would help a community know if they're doing well or not, like top, top three. Yeah. Uh, well, we've identified a dozen communities that have low per person costs. They have a substantial population. So we aren't just dealing with places that have 100 Medicare beneficiaries. So they have a substantial population. They have uh, in the 10th decile lowest costs per person and in the 10th decile highest AHRQ quality indicators and low pressure ulcers and low beers drugs. So that begins to say, you know, here's a group of a dozen counties that look like they're uh, pulling it off a whole lot better than most others. So you can take your county and compare against those and begin to say, oh, well, you know, if they can get the cost down to this, why are we at three times that? Or why are we um, not using any advanced care planning? Or why are we not using any transitional care management? Um, you know, so you can start, you know, we're, we're right at the phase now where we're working with various possible users as to what it is that would most excite them, you know, what would actually motivate change. Um, so that's exactly where we are right now. We've only had the data for a couple of months, so. Um, okay. So hot so off that, the presses. Yep, but I think Carrie's hoping to use it out in California. Yeah, we may be uh, knocking on your door very, very soon because part of what one of the uh, exciting things about the master plan for aging was that they have a very specific research subcommittee, which I've been working with very closely to create a dashboard as well as plans for ongoing analysis, evaluation, and benchmarking of how California is doing over the next 10 years. And I think we definitely need to talk about you. And I, I also just want to say you're absolutely right about the ge geography. When we're in these stakeholder meetings, there's a couple of stakeholders who will always say this all is well and good, but the majority of California is actually rural and we don't have these services. We don't have a PACE program in every county. We don't have an adult daycare in every county. So it's just so important to get that data out there. And there, I also found when COVID hit, there was, it really showed me how little um, policymakers and leaders know about their aging population. I mean, we were at the point where we were telling people, this is the number of old people in California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and now with-, with... Alone. So, you know, and people said, what? That's crazy. So, I mean, we were there. <laughs> so if we could get to the point where we could use your data to really identify the regions that don't have these services, uh, that would be wonderful. Yeah. The, the uh, enormous range in the cost of services and, um, the things like the uh, average HCC score, where you can see whole areas with aggressive coding of diagnoses that are driving up the HCC score, and other areas where the doctors haven't gotten around to that yet, and their HCC scores are low. And this is just a coding fluke. It I mean, clearly the populations are very similar. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot you can learn from digging in even this data, even though I keep kind of edge, pushing against the edges and saying, you know, why can't we get this and why can't we get that? You know, we ought to be able to put in, for example, the waiting list for Meals on Wheels. 
we ought to be able to put in. Um, now we are working with Oasis and MDS, which are the assessments for home care and nursing home care. So we can now find a lot of the people who have two or more ADL dependencies. And we can find the people who have cognitive failure. And we can find the people who become duels and the people who started the year as duels. Wow. Um, so then you can start seeing how these special populations with high needs are taken care of. Um, but in, you know, in the COVID era, what you were saying about you know, people just did not realize what was going on with the elderly. It's just written all over the face of the guidelines and the, um, the, the stuff coming out of the federal government. Yeah. You know, to this day, there is not yet a federal guideline that calls on nursing homes to know what their residents want. The most yeah. fundamental thing yeah. is to know what the patient wants. <laughs> and so we're treating people in nursing homes as if they were cattle, where well, the only thing yeah. that counts is that they survive. But I want to ask yeah. you this, Joanne. You know, I've been doing this work for decades, as you have. And I think, I know there's no silver lining to COVID. But if there were a silver lining, one thing I'm seeing is for the first time ever that I've been doing this work, people are interested. And especially in nursing homes and congregate settings. I found that in the past, there were certain people who wanted to say, no, we don't need those. We're just going to move people to home and community-based services. We don't need to talk about congregate settings. And then there was the other set of people who just didn't want to think about it. And because of that, we've allowed really egregious abuse and horrible, you know, lack of nursing home reform. Um, we all know what's going on there. So one of the things that I see as hopeful, if there is anything that's hopeful, is that people are finally listening. I have, you know, politicians and state legislature who are very interested in these issues. And so I wanted to ask you, do you think this is a window of opportunity? And if so, how long do you think that window is going to last? Yeah, I think there will be windows. I don't think we're quite at the window opening yet. People are becoming aware, as you say, and they're paying attention. But right now, the Congress and most state governments are so still dealing with the sprint. You know, how are we going to cope with today's issue? And as it lengthens into the marathon, um, I think there will be windows of opportunity, which is why we have to have very good proposals sort of all lined up and ready to go um, so that they can be pushed through those windows quickly. <laughs> um, we have put uh, on the Medicare website a set of um, issue briefs on five topics. Let's see if I can get them. Transportation, caregivers, um, uh, the um, financing, the uh, abuse and neglect, and housing. And we also have put up a blog that we're hoping is crowdsourced. So everybody on, on the call or on the podcast can go to medicaring.org and add their ideas or modify the ones that are there um, as to what, what ought to be done about nursing homes. And then with any luck, we'll converge on you know, some small number, three or four or five things that are worth really pushing through including in the upcoming elections, but even beyond that, get, watch for those windows and, and be ready with uh, the proposal that'll win. Yeah. So well, you mentioned the sprint. Sorry. I was just, sorry, I was just saying, you mentioned the sprint. So what are some of the short term things that within nursing homes that, that COVID has drawn light to? And then we can talk about well, the longer term reforms that are needed. There are the obvious ones that, they're so incredibly obvious and so much talked about in the news that it is just bizarre that we are not yet supplying them. So we need personal protective equipment. We need testing. More than anything, we need staffing. And when a nursing home gets hit hard, there needs to be supplemental staffing very quickly. And not with the National Guard, but with people who know what they're doing. So yeah, we need those sorts of things, of course. But then the other thing we need is to start talking to the families and the residents and getting in tune with what risks they're willing to take. The only thing important mm -hmm. in the last three or four months of my life is not to avoid COVID. I might want to see my kids and hug them once. I might want to go to a church service. I might want to see a sunrise. You know, the, this whopping 
uh, focus on prevention, which we aren't doing very well at, mm -hmm. but you know, protecting the nursing home resident is not the only thing they care about, but we are just completely ignoring them and it's maddening. Solitary confinement for 1.3 <laughs> million people for half a year. Yeah, now, and my did, grandmother that with 20 year olds, we'd be, we'd be in big trouble. We would be. Yeah. Not to mention, you know, the effects of that on people's cognitive and physical decline. I mean, I've been saying you have people who were at least walking a couple times a day to the dining room who are no longer doing that. After this is over, they're not going to be able to walk to the dining room anymore. Um, we're seeing the cognitive decline, not just in nursing homes, but in community dwelling seniors who aren't talking to anyone all day. So there's all these other effects that are happening from this, having to do both in congregate settings and in the community from, from this social isolation that I think we're, we have not even scratched the surface of what we're going to see. And yeah, no and one's about, feeling, I'm sorry, go ahead, Melissa. I was just going to say, like, you know, it's not just the residents, it's their families too, because my mom is, my grandmother turned 91 um, last Saturday, and she's not seen yeah, you know, she's not made me give my grandmother a hug since March. So it's, I agree. If there were 1.3 million 20 year olds that were told you can't leave your room, um, it's just crazy. We can't even keep them out of bars. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But the the other thing that's maddening with the nursing homes is the immunity issue. We have now tens of millions of people who have had COVID and we have not a single proven reinfection. So probably there's some immunity. I mean, the chances are pretty good for at least a few months. And yet all the guidance ignores the possibility of immunity and doesn't treat them any differently. So they're still supposed to be tested in surveillance testing. They're still supposed to be kept in their room. Well, we aren't sure about immunity yet. Okay, we aren't sure about it yet, but we do have a lot of evidence. So, you know, it would seem like you could tell people, you know, we aren't sure about it yet, but it's a pretty good bet that you could hug your daughter for at least the next few months and we'll keep an eye on whether reinfections start to happen. But no, there's no accommodation for immunity. And that's just outrageous. The way we are treating nursing home people ought to be um, They're just not being treated as human. It, it, it brings to mind another question I have and something we've been talking about in California. This is not for the, um, for the immediate sprint. This is for the long haul. But over our 10-year master plan, could we be the state that reforms the structure and the architecture of nursing homes over time that turns them into like the greenhouse model with 10 single occupancy rooms around a beautiful living room, a home-like settings where residents and their caregivers cook together, a place where, you know, you might where want the, to go. Where the staff and the residents eat together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's groundbreaking. Might, <laughs> when you got done recovering from your hip replacement, maybe you'd be a little sad to leave because it was so mm -hmm. helpful and it was so, relaxing to be there. So what if we set our sights on that kind of a future for congregate settings um, instead of trying to pretend they don't exist, trying to pretend like no one's ever going to need them? Yeah, right. I think that uh, the idea that uh, Terry Fulmer and others have written about that the post-hospital stays need to be in some sort of a hospital-like environment. Uh, yeah. People are going to be there for two weeks, three weeks. They're they're not going to create friendships. They're not invested in the place. They're learning to rewalk with their new hip. And then the people who have to live a long time in a nursing home need more home-like settings and need a stable staff and need an adequate staff. And, uh, you know, I've been in nursing homes that had terrible uh, physical environment and still were wonderful places to live. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a lot easier in a place that has 10 or 20 people living there, not 700. So and you know, why did post-acute care move out of hospital post-acute settings into nursing homes? I'm still trying uh, to understand this. And how it, it was, I lived through that. It, yeah, I mean, and, and the nursing home that I was working in was very reticent to take on this, um, you know, subacute uh, 
uh, rehab stuff because it changed the environment that they had worked so hard to create. Um, and But it was because the DRGs made it very attractive to shorten the length of stay in a hospital. And the payment rate for SNFs was set high enough that it cross-subsidized all the other nursing home behaviors. So everybody sort of, you know, maneuvered to cut the hospital time shorter, have this SNF stay, you know, the skilled nursing facility stay in the middle before you went home, whereas, you know, just a few years earlier, that whole thing would have been in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Now, hospitals have become dangerous enough for our elders, and I'm not sure that I want to say, oh, we should go back to those very long hospital stays. You know, they don't walk people uh, you know, like nursing homes do. They don't help them get up, and they don't you know, generally have congregate eating and so on. So, you know, hosp a typical hospital is not a nifty place for my older person either, mm -hmm. but neither is a good nursing home because they're so disruptive. You know, somebody comes in, gets isolated for two weeks by that point they're ready to go home you know they're they don't allow friendships to form and um, you know table interactions and so forth so um, yeah we really need to rethink it and I hope California will take the lead uh, Newsom was certainly behind it at one point I hope uh, I hope well, you'll get we behind some, we need some advice from you for sure <laughs> so well. We kind of talked a little bit about the financing. So what do you think are um, prospects for for financing elder care moving forward? Well, you the know, current system obviously doesn't work. It's getting to the point where it is so much more expensive to do nothing than it is to really break out and do some of the right things. Um, we, before COVID, we were already in big trouble on financing elder care when the boomers hit uh, disability, when they're you know, 80, 85 or more, and large numbers are getting disabled. Um, they don't have enough savings. They don't have any insurance. They have relatively small families and often uh, very distant. And by the time a boomer is 90 and getting disabled, you know, their kids are 65 and 70 and they already have arthritis. So this idea that it's just a family thing and the government should stay out of it is just, um, you know, it's, it's anachronistic. Uh, the best idea, I think, is an insurance scheme and probably a really deliberately public-private insurance scheme um, where the government picks up the most costly long-term patients and the individual stays responsible for the upfront costs. So this is a scheme that was worked out by Mark Cohen, Judy Fetter, and Melissa Favreau, and has a certain amount of um, currency and popularity um, on the Hill and among gerontologists and among advocates. The challenge, of course, is that to have a backstop that picks up after one, two, three, or four years, depending on how wealthy you are um, and your opportunities to contribute, um, requires that you contribute during your working years and then it kicks in 20 years later when you become disabled. So a 40 year old... Well, let's not say when, let's just say if. Because <laughs> well, half of pe almost half of people escape long-term care, but That's almost yeah. half of us will get long-term care. I mean, you, you most of the illnesses... But long-term, and, and just to be clear, that long-term care does not necessarily mean nursing, like skilled nursing home care, that there's oh, a... No. No, yeah, I just don't want us to give people the impression that the stat I see is seven. If you make it to 65, 70% of people will need long term care at some right, point. Right. Yeah. And most of the illnesses that we have that used to kill people abruptly now are converted to chronic illnesses. So, you know, when I was in medical school in the 70s, we had lots of what now would count as young men dying of their first heart attack. We have very few of those anymore. It's very uncommon, very uncommon to die with your first stroke. Much more likely that you get frailty of advanced old age or you get an organ system that takes the lead and you have liver failure or you have heart and lung failure, but, or, you know, 40% of us who make it to 80 will have cognitive failure. Um, so, you know, long-term care becomes a relatively predictable thing. Yes, some people will escape it by having something that kills them abruptly, 
but most people actually prefer to live with chronic illness and even substantial disability for at least a while <laughs> before dying. Um, right. And we've never really built the financing for that. The market for long-term care insurance is almost a dead market. It sells mm -hmm. you know, 100,000 policies a year. That's dust in the system. Wow. So the, but building a system that's reliable enough to trust for 50 years you know, from the time you start paying in when you're 40 or so to the time you need it when you're 85 <laughs> you know, um, requires building something that is a pretty strong social insurance and it requires getting out beyond almost all politicians time frame you know the governor is worried about his election in four years the house of representatives is worried about their election in two years where's the person who's worried about 50 years <laughs> you know? so we have to get the public terribly invested in there being better ways of dealing with the finances or we are going to have one heck of a lot of elderly people without housing without food without the very basics and since medicare is an entitlement we'll be able to write prescriptions for $60,000 drugs for someone who's living on the streets at 90. That ought to be an image that would really mobilize people. But mm -hmm. thus far, it, it's pretty hard to get people to deal with that as a likely outcome. Joanne, I, I, I'm really interested in your thoughts on, um, I, I love the Cohen Favreau plan, but I agree with you that the private insurance market is for long-term care is dead and it, we just showed that nobody wanted to buy it. So one of the new pieces of the puzzle are these new state-based uh, front-end LTSS benefits, like what Washington put in place, and California has, has been working with an actuary to develop a plan for that. Do you think the state-based front-end LTSS universal benefits could replace the role of the long-term care um, insurance in the Cohen Favreau plan? Um, you know, all of these things have many moving parts and you have to end up kind of pulling them all together. I certainly don't object in any way to the states doing this. That's terrific. Go for it. Um, they, the one in Washington state, if you're modeling on that one, um, covers $35,000, 500, um, after 10 years of input. So people now 55 who work to 65 and then get disabled at 85 will have, you know, presumably the inflation adjusted $35,000 worth. And then they'll be back in the same position they are now of having to have saved or whatever. And it is the case that that gets a, a sizable chunk of people out of the um, impoverishment system. So it, it's well worth doing. If we had that and the Cohen Feder Favreau plan, then there would be a quite manageable gap where the premiums would be quite low and would not be at much risk of escalating. So, you know, if um, let's say the average person had had to cover two years worth and their upfront state-based plan covered one year worth, and then the feds were going to kick in after two years, they've only got to cover one year. And so the premium on that, given that only 25 or 30% of the population will ever need it, will be spread over such a large population that you could sell tailored products to uh, cohorts as small as a thousand people. You know, right now, if you sell a long-term care insurance policy and have to cover maybe 20 years of long-term care services, um, you have to sell to hundreds of thousands of people because it's very hard to spread that kind of cost. Uh, so most of the ones that are even available now are severely capped. So they'll only cover three years or they'll only cover $200,000 or something yeah. like that. So they're inadequate. If the feds picked up the tail then some combination of your state, your locality, your fraternal organization, your buying insurance, your having three children who love you dearly and live within a mile, you know, some combination is going to manage for most people. And then, you know, Medicaid will still be the safety net for people for whom all of those things fail. But um, the issue is so big that it's going to take multiple solutions. Yeah. And the, the hard part is that no one can predict what you're going to need. I think if people well, actually, knew, like... That's okay. the wonderful thing, because that's what makes it appropriate for insurance. 
You can't know whether you're going to be the person who has a stroke tomorrow and has 20 years of needing around the clock um, supportive services or whether you're going to be somebody who lives to 86 and dies in her sleep and never had a minute's you know, disability. Right. But only the fear of the first scenario yep. makes you buy the insurance. <laughs> right. And most people think that they're the second one, that second example. Well, it's actually, not going to happen to me, so it's not my problem. Actually, yeah. most people avoid thinking about it at all. True. <laughs> <laughs> so it isn't that they actually think that they will just evaporate. It's that they try really hard not to think about advanced old age. And would, we need to tie, get around it. Would you tie this uh, tail end benefit, catastrophic benefit, to have a, a prerequisite for qualifying for it to buy this this private the private insurance? You know, I don't I don't think so. I think I mean that would just make it one step harder politically. I think. Um, uh, if, if there's been some discussion of whether to allow people to opt out. And I think if you bought a paid up front end coverage by age 55, then maybe we would allow opt out because you've covered yourself. Um, but um, I think that, uh, it, it, I mean, again, there are lots of moving parts. And um, I think that, um, I mean, encouraging people to buy for the upfront, once the price is much lower, the products are much more varied and much more tailored to your situation. And then make it uh, possible to buy it out of tax-free, you know, pre-tax dollars like you would childcare. Um, you know, and, and have the income come back to the person um, as a tax-free income like insurance does. So, you know, there's some ways to make it more attractive. Um, and, and for people to be talking about it, you know, if at 40 you started paying this surcharge on Medicare, uh, on your Medicare tax, a lot of people would be talking about it at 40. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we're kind of towards the end of our time. Um, so maybe if you have some final comments or a call to action, um, just share your final thoughts. Well, I'd encourage folks to um, use our issue briefs on medicaring.org. Um, they, they are free. They're available in HTML, PDF, and Word. You can customize them any way you want. But this is a quick way to get all the appropriate references and best ideas uh, in order to tackle your representatives in the upcoming election. And then uh, help me out with the crowdsourcing on, um, on nursing home reform. You know, what are the best ideas? What is it people would really want to have happen? Um, there's a blog on medicaring.org. It's the top blog. Uh, just go and add your ideas and I'll periodically update it. Um, and feed it back into people. You know, there are lots of advocates, but there's not a strong advocate for long-term services and supports. Mm -hmm. There's you know, kind of there's a little bit on the caregiver side and there's a little bit on the Medicare side and there's a little bit on the nursing home side. But we don't actually have a strong heavyweight sticking their neck out <laughs> to get reforms in long-term care. So we really need to help generate that push through a coalition where we converge on things and say, there are three things we need and here they are. <laughs> um, and, and we're all saying it so that uh, the message gets through. Okay. What would you say, Carrie? Well, I would say, in addition to your Medicaring crowdsourcing, the Master Plan for Aging has uh, gotten about 400 recommendations from individuals and organizations all over the state. We just came out this week with drafts of recommendations for reform in pretty much the same four or five areas that you were, you were discussing. Um, so let's get those two together. Um, I'll send you the recommendations in California. We'll look at your website and um, there are people who care about this right now and let's do this during the window. Onward. <laughs> Sounds good to me. So thank you both for being here um, today um, to discuss elder care, both the present and the future. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for joining us for this special series of This Is Getting Old. 
sponsored by the Health and Aging Policy Fellows Program, Capstone Conversations is brought to you by Melissa B., Ph.D., in collaboration with the George Washington University's Center for Aging, Health, and Humanities. Thank you for joining me today for This is Getting Old. If you'd like to know more, you can subscribe to my YouTube channel. And if you have any questions or a related topic you'd like to hear from me about, just let me know. Thanks.